Hello everyone, I'm James Rosen. And I'm Dave Kemble, and this is the Practicus Digital Transformation Podcast. Hello everybody, Uh, this week we are delighted to be joined by Enrique Fernandez-Pino. Enrique is an award-winning business leader with significant experience in technology, innovation, strategy development and planning, digital transformation and large-scale program delivery. He has a proven track record of developing clear visions with the aid of technology and business strategy and converting them into pragmatic, down-to-earth, implementable solutions. His career has taken him across numerous industries including technology, digital development, retail, finance, supply chain, transport, property law and the military. Welcome, Enrique. Hello, guys. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So the first question, Enrique, which we're asking every single guest speaker that comes on this is quite simply, what does digital mean to you? Well, it's it's an interesting question, of course, because it means different things to to different people. So for me, it's it's the integration of technology, specifically digital technologies, into everyday physical life. And what I mean by this is, if you think about your day, you start with an alarm clock waking you up instead of a, of a chicken, and then you move on to, you know, you've got a key in your pocket uh, that opens your car, and Google tells you which way to go, and you get your emails and your messages with, with notifications and stuff, and uh, there's an alarm uh, system and a camera in your house to make sure that burglars don't go in. So for me, that, that, that path of life is the same as it's always been, which is moving from home to work, or at least when we can go back to work. But of course, it gets supported and enhanced and augmented by, by technology. And for me, that is, um, for me, that is uh, digital. That's a good answer. I quite like that. I, I'm not sure about yeah how uh, how often uh, there'll be people out there who do still get woken up by chickens. I certainly get woken up by the neighbour's dog. But you're <laughs> quite right. It's uh, <laughs> it's it's a very interesting point that you make where digital has encompassed all our lives now, with perhaps without us even noticing. Yeah, it has, and and it's because the important thing on digital is that behind. It's digital for me means human. It doesn't mean machine, it means human. And uh, so, for instance, I believe uh, deeply that artificial intelligence should not replace humans. It should complement the humans, rank hands or, or, or augment the humans, and that humans must be at the heart of digital. And therefore, that's why it's um, it's it's, it's um, affecting all, all aspects of life, because behind it is humans, not, not so much computers. Interesting. And... In a work environment, have you seen that same transition with regards to digital being introduced and being embraced within organizations? Absolutely. And um, you just have to see if I always use the same example, which is if the SARS virus had caught on in, I think it was 2003, we would have been stuck because we didn't have the technology at the time to be able to cope with it like we like we are coping with it today through work from home through the use of uh, of computers through the use of mobile phones we didn't have any of those things back in 2003 so we would have been really really stuck yeah absolutely Uh, technology has certainly made leaps and bounds and almost everyone has the latest phone or certainly access to the internet within their pocket yeah. you, you don't have the uh, arguments down the pub as to who scored which goal in uh, which final anymore you can just google it straight away so yeah you're, yeah exactly you're absolutely right interesting in in terms of uh, sort of your working experience Enrique, i mean you were actually working when the pandemic and, and lockdown hit the uk uh, w- what was your experience uh, and and you know how prepared were you uh, and the company you worked for at the time to deal with that that's a great question and uh, it, it's to be honest it depends there were things that we could predict and things that we could not predict so um, at the time I was working with go ahead which is a, a leader operator of public transport we could never predict that the takings would go down of the passenger and the, and and uh, w- w- 
we're going to go down to below 10% of, of the current shave and, and close to zero at times. In in, uh, in the railway, we saw even worse. At some point, it was just 2 5%. That we could not predict. We could not do much about it. However, they they I think I was quite lucky because I, I grew up in retail. And in retail, or retailers tend to do an exercise every week, or at least when I was in retail, uh, called uh, avian flu pandemic, funny enough, which is where you think about what would happen if there was a uh, an avian flu pandemic. And I think that prepared me for, uh, you know, to prepare, go ahead for, for, a, for a situation like this one. So um, our, our scenario was different. We Our head office was in at the heart of Westminster, funny enough, above the Conservative Party campaign headquarters. So we um we, we always assume that there would have been you know they could be at any point uh they, they could be an uh you know an alert that there was a bomb or a terrorist a, a threat or something and my team could not go to the building so um you know through the years i i moved the organization to office 365 in 2016 uh moved to, to the cloud as much as i could considering the systems that we had any new system was built in aws or azure we strengthen you know we're strengthening our vpn services and the it service desk um was every six months we did an exercise by which they would work from home just to make sure that you know, should, should the worst happen and we get a, an alert that we cannot go to the office for a couple of days while the police sorts the problem, um, we, people could work from home. So for us, it was pretty much overnight. We could have people working from home. Uh, situation was a bit different in the depot, where obviously people still had to, to drive buses and trains and so on. But in head office, it was, it was reasonably well, well, um, because it was predictable to a, to a degree, it was it was well managed. That's a really good point, and actually, I, I can imagine that there's lots of industries and lots of organisations where they, you know, they would have run these kind of test scenarios for various things, and I, undoubtedly that would have helped them, you know, move very quickly into a state of, you know, lockdown and everyone work from home. So, um, it's interesting. I think I think a lot of companies, if they if they weren't doing it before, will, will definitely be doing that kind of, you know, plan. They will, uh, and I think it's. I don't think it's, it's sensible to not plan for something like that because any you know a building can flood it doesn't have to be a, a terrorist alert a building can flood you know uh, the roof can collapse that happens everywhere in in in, in the world every day you know incidents of of uh, we had a flood actually one day in, uh, in our call center in uh, up in newcastle uh, and we had to let you know let people work from home for a couple of days while the plumbers fixed it the, the problem so i think it's uh, uh, people should have planned for 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 not not for this size of emergency but for for the you know the, the emergency of of not being able to work at, 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 at the office i would hazard a guess that you're quite unique in that approach in that forward thinking to be able to prepare your teams to have the ability to work from home because i my understanding is for the vast majority of industries this was very unique, the, the shift from nine till five in the office, five days a week, to being fully remote was something that came as a, a shock for most industries. Do you think that? Do you find that you're, you were in a unique position? I think I was lucky that I had been trained in retail and our head office was in a very, very strategic kind of uh, place for, for terrorism. So maybe it was a little bit more aware of, of, of the risks of not being able to get to offices than, than uh, the average person. Um, however, as, as proven by retailers, preparation is, is critical because as we, as we become more dependent on technology and digital technologies, we gonna have to plan for not having it. So you know, if you deploy a system, you should really have a plan B in case the system is not working. That's a really good point. And actually, I think the fact that you kind of already made some steps towards that, you know, digital strategy and getting everyone working from home before you know lockdown hit would have been a big help for you guys. I mean, we we covered off in the first podcast that um, you know having a a really robust digital strategy was you know incredibly important and making sure that it aligns always to you know what the the business objectives are. I mean, what what are your what are your thoughts on that? I mean, how how important do you think it is that that is you know that, that they're constantly intertwined? 
the, 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 it's critical. So uh, I always say, and people laugh when I say it, but it's true that although I'm a CIO, I do not like computers. Uh, and the reason why the reason why I say it is, and I'm genuine when I say it is, I'm not interested in the models, in the servers, the routers, the switches. I don't care. What I'm interested in is what what they can do for, for for the rest of the business, for the business as a whole. So basically, for me, a good digital strategy has to be it has to be two things really. It has to be um, aligned with the business objectives because technology is is an enabler uh, for, for for the the whole business to operate it's not something in itself maybe it was a few years ago when big companies were running big data centers and kind of it became like a reason for being but in today you know in 2021 it is at the service of the rest of the business um so much so that i i always encourage my teams to not say IT and the business, but IT and the rest of the business, because you, you're part of it and your strategy needs to be 100% aligned to the rest of the business. Otherwise, what happens is they will go um, shadow IT. If, if, if the strategy that you design as a CIO doesn't reconcile what the business needs or the rest of the business needs, then they will go shadow IT. They will look, uh, especially today in the world of, uh, of uh, software as a service, they will just go and buy a, a, a tool that you don't know of. And, and the other, for me, the other big characteristic of a, of a good digital uh, a strategy is, is purpose. I, I am really tired of, of looking at uh, kind of solutions looking for problems and people coming to me with widgets and gadgets with no real real reason for being other than it's a great thing in reality um the digital has to have a purpose and the purpose is the good of of, of the business and society as a whole not not you know not prettiness or is the last uh, hype thing or or etc or etc cetera, et cetera. that's interesting i i remember when we spoken in the past Enrique you mentioned that companies should be looking at who is using the technology uh, rather than just going out and getting the latest greatest uh, software or hardware you need to identify what is the job that needs to be achieved by the people using that piece of equipment for example and it, it, I know you, you've worked within the passenger transport world for a long time and thinking about engineers who are out on the, the tracks, for example, giving them the wrong piece of equipment is is going to cause all kinds of problems. It could be fatal. You, in the same way as, as you don't, in the same way as you, a carpenter uses a, a hammer for nails and a screwdriver for screws, the same happens with digital tools. They, they they have to have a purpose. They need to be tailored to to the job and on hand. There's no point on giving people the wrong thing. For instance, you mentioned about trucks. It's fascinating how today we're using geofencing to identify when a person on the track is in proximity with a train. So um, so someone can do something about it before before there's there's, a, there's an incident. Um, or we use in Fristons are starting to use artificial intelligence to recognize when people at the end of a platform um, are behaving in a way that indicates that they could be about to jump onto the track. That, that's great use of technology. It's not that it's pretty or clever, which it, which it is, but it's, it's because it has a purpose, it has a, a, a reason for being. It serves something good for the business and society as a whole. Interesting. And, and so, and that leads me on to my next question then you you've obviously done this on on a, numerous occasions now uh, in your experience what are some of the common pitfalls uh, an organization uh, has when implementing a digital transformation program do you see recurrences yes we've all made mistakes hey hands up um uh, and, and and whoever says they hadn't um they're lying to be blunt um so for, for me, the key one is, is, is I've kind of mentioned it earlier, which is, is, is if you focus too much in technology. It, it's, so a, a good digital deployment is, is a business change deployment. It's not a technology deployment. Again, it could have been in the olden times of, you know, we need to buy seven 
servers and two routers and one switch and make sure the whole thing works. But today is about is about the trilogy, it's about the people, the process and the technology. And if you don't club the three together, the solution is incomplete, it doesn't get adopted, um, and, it, and it frankly it doesn't work, it leads to shadow IT. It, for me, it, it's it's a combination of the three things. I, I run a campaign in my team, I don't know, it must have been three or four years ago, where I called it from server to service, and my intention was to make sure that people were focusing on 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 the people that need the tool as opposed to the to the tool itself. So, for instance, the, the service desk were sending messages for outages, indicating to the nth degree of detail the the the, the uh, identification of the server number and the server room and whatever, but without telling people what was the impact on their job. And the idea was to flip it and to and to do it the other way around. It was like first you tell people where you're gonna what are you gonna touch and what implication is it gonna have for them, and then don't bother but with the server with the server number. But you, if you want to, then put it at the at the end in, in very very little letters. So what so, were the three things again, Enrique? You talked about the trilogy. Then it felt like Lord of the Rings. People, like, people, process technology. I haven't invented this. is a is a classic change. Uh, 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 you know, um, um, approach. It's when when you implement a digital solution, you need to think of the three things. You need to think of people. How are you going to affect them? How are they going to? What training do they need? What you know? What, how are you going to? How are you changing their life? How are you changing the way they do things? You need to work about, think about process because if you implement the tool with no process, it'll break it and and they'll hate it. And of course, technology, the three things, not just one in isolation. Yeah, I think again, guys, going back to your earlier points, it's about solutions looking for problems. I think you under you need to understand the impact of of how each of those kind of three points of the triangle impact on the actual end user. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, another one, another classic one is is architectural m mistakes, and and this is where I have to pull my my tech hat on and say, um, don't, don't I wouldn't I wouldn't go for flat statements like everything has to go to the cloud. Well, it has or it hasn't. I don't know. Uh, you need to you need to work out the solution, the best solution, the best integration, the best business case, and the cloud. Guess what? May not be the best solution for something. I don't know, but the architectural decisions earlier on are absolutely critical to, to the success of this, and therefore a big pitfall is is not doing it. But, but and the, and the final one is, <laughs> which we always forget, is organizational design. So often we we do the change, but then we don't adapt the organization to that change. A classic would be. If you have moved more than I don't know sixty percent of your technology to the cloud, your IT team will have to look different. You will need you will not need developers anymore. You may not need infrastructure people anymore, but you need a lot of architectural people and a lot of service delivery type people. It just changes completely the the nature of the team and the organization design around it. Don't do it; it'll fail. <laughs> I think you're right. I think that's a good example of how digital transformation can be applied and how it affects you know the 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 employees and the the internal kind of cogs of a of a company but you know one of one of the key reasons why an organization might embark on a new digital transformation program is to change the way that they're maybe perceived externally so how the way that they yeah, you know, yeah. they communicate with and and how they're viewed by their their customers um you know do you have any you know personal insights into what you know, methods or strategies, you know, are more successful than others in terms of how to, you know, um, communicate with your customers better? I, I, I do. And I, I wanted to use a retail example. So um, I live in St. Albans, which is a big city. Therefore, we're quite privileged. We have a Tesco, we've got a Sensories, we've got a Morrison's, we've got a Waitress, you know, all of them. And for me, range is is all right. You know, I kind of as so long as I can get the normal stuff. I'm not into exotic stuff, so I don't need much of a range. And and money is important, but only relatively important for me. Time is is all I care about, and therefore. I have not time to, to go around and then go pull all the things on a conveyor belt, you know, someone scanning, none of that. So for me, having a good scan and go uh, app in my mobile phone is, is critical. So I worked for 12 years of my life in Tesco and my pension is with them. And I really, really sorry to say their app is not great. 
it has glitches and a couple of times it's deleted my whole shopping halfway through the, the, the journey and then you have to start again or go through through the conveyor belt which wasn't great so i chucked it away Waitress works. It's a really good app, but my local shop doesn't. My O2 coverage is really low, and they don't do Wi-Fi. Therefore, I have no access and halfway through the shop, so I chucked it away. Morrison's don't do an app, so I, I didn't even bother uh, trying. <laughs> Therefore, I ended up in centuries, and all of this is custom. It's pure customer experience. It, it's it's driven by my digital experience in shopping in a in a store. Um, I was quite. I was. I was um, doing a lot online, but after the, the lockdown, uh, those slots were reserved for people self-isolating and the rest of it. So I had to learn to go back to the shop, but I did it with an app, and I chose the one that worked. It's that simple. For me, uh, the, the key to this is is always walk on the steps of the client, and and I think that a big mistake that very many people do is uh, create something without picturing it, like if you were the client. I would encourage executives in banks to not ask their PAs to do um, their admin for them when it comes to mortgages and, and bank accounts and do it themselves. And then maybe, just maybe, we will improve the way we can open, close, change addresses and do a stuff in uh, with our bank accounts. If they, if they walked the walk, then they would come with great digital solutions because they would realize what, what they need to do. And the final one, James, is test. Uh, I am, I've seen so very many times uh, speed being more important than quality. And then what happens is you go, you go to market with an untested and proven solution, which kind of is half cooked and doesn't kind of work. And then people don't try again in this day and age. If you have an app or, or a tool uh, and, you don't, and it doesn't work first time, to move on and to the next thing because we've kind of developed that behavior as a society. It's interesting what you say about knowing your customer. And I, I, I sincerely hope the, the branch managers of major supermarkets in St. Albans are listening to that valuable market research. Yeah. That's a really good insight. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to learn there, I think. It's, no, it's, I think well, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because there will be other people of perhaps a certain, certain generation who don't have to worry about time, should we say. And actually, the interaction with the staff is a key part of their day almost, going to, to see people. But yeah. that really goes to what you're saying. You, want, you need to understand what do your customers want from digital? What are they looking for? Um, it, it's interesting how you know, we keep talking about how society has embraced technology more and more. And I know, I know you I alluded to this earlier. You talked about the passenger transport space, but I, I worked for British Airways back in the, the mid to late 90s, and they introduced the first self-service check-in at yeah. Heathrow in Terminal 4. Now, when they first introduced that, I had to physically manhandle people over to go and use the self-service yeah. check-in because they were, they were terrified of it. They, it, it. This was an important journey, whether it was a holiday or a business trip, it was too important to be left to technology at that point. Fast forward 20 years and you'd be hard pressed to find someone who wants to see a human being and interact with a human being whilst they yeah. go through the airport. They want to be able to check in online at home, download the app and have the, the boarding pass on their phone and to be able to go through the airport without having to see another human being if they possibly can. Very true. In the industry, we call it friction. Is that bad? Right. Um, uh, uh, and it's because it's because we are. Time is becoming so important in our lives that we've lost that ability to have to have time to, to talk to other people, and uh, and it becomes a, a point of friction. If you have to talk to a bus driver and and kind of discuss the route that you're going, and then pay with uh, cash and whatever, it's a disruption. Now, um, even if you have the time, you're there, people are waiting, you can sense that they are waiting. If instead of that, you come there, you tap with your contact list, and then you tap out when you leave the bus and the back office kind of calculates the fare for you, it's brilliant. Yeah, I, I must admit, I know what you mean, because even things like 
when you're at the checkout and you can see someone is packing their bags, but they've not got their card ready to pay. You think, come on, this yeah. is 10 seconds you're cutting into uh, into our, our day. It's absolutely crazy. Ten, how things 10 are... seconds per passenger is a lot of time to waste, though, to be honest. Uh, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Well, that's a, it's a really good point. I mean, within the, the the transport industry, do you think there is more the sector could be doing to use digital technology more effectively? Absolutely. I mean, we've we've done a lot already. We, uh, you know, we've got e-commerce like the train line or B two B e-commerce like contract retail. We've got mobile applications that can provide, you know, real time information or information about stops and stations. And if you, for instance, if you download the uh, Gatwick Express app, which is one of those that my team developed, it it, it takes you from pretty much your home all the way to the gate of your plane. Like the, the app will be telling you the status of the trains, and the status of the airport, and where it got integrated with Gatwick Airport, and it tells you which is the gate, uh, the gate of your plane. So a lot has been done. Contactless, for instance, uh, is now becoming the standard. So it was only TFL up until four years ago. Now it's everywhere. And even pay as you go um, in, you know, in, when I was in Go Ahead, we were the first ones to do pay as you go contactless in buses because it's quite complicated. And um, and it's brilliant. It's not working in, in very many places and you're seeing less and less cash in, in motion. Um, what needs to be done, though, is, is integration. Um, it's... And, and we need to differentiate, we call it, you know, islands and bridges. And the way to picture it is imagine two cities, the, the, the islands, and then there's a, a typically a train or a coach connecting the two cities, which would be a bridge. Now, the, the, type, of, the type of digital solution that we need for those two trips is completely different. In cities, we need we have a huge in- intensity of services, diversity. You know, trams, buses. You know, even even now scooters and stuff like that. Uh, we we want simple fare, simple tariffs. We kind of don't care too much about money in terms of if the fare is three fifty instead of uh, uh, two eighty. Is all right. Um, we we you know we want fast onboarding, fast lighting. So in this environment, we need to, to make sure that we everything is very very simple and probably contactless kind of based, like like TFL has proven with the with the underground buses. If you move on to the bridges, then it's a completely different experience. It goes it goes back, Dave, to your point about the airplane, which is you've got time. You're going to be moving from London to Newcastle. You've got time to plan your trip. You've got time to uh, the high value tickets as well. And uh, as you said earlier, it's an important trip. And and uh, and, and you know you, you you've got the possibility to print a ticket in your in your own home. You may have multiple legs. And and in this case, probably mobile apps and QR codes like the planes have, like the airplane industry have implemented, is probably the right solution, a lot better than contactless. So I think we need to tailor it a little bit more and we need to integrate it a little bit more uh, and uh, and provide, you know, provide expert, uh, 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 you know, real-time information about things. Um, a great example, actually, of... Um, because the other thing that that we we can we still need to do a lot of in in the in the public transport industry is implement Internet of Things, and the opportunities are phenomenal. And I've got a brilliant example. Um, one, one of my colleagues is the CIO in one of the uh, two train operators in in Switzerland, and what they have implemented, what they have with implementing, is incredibly clever. So they've put cameras with uh, image recognition in the trains on the on the on the lower part of the train and they're constantly scanning the track for for, for fractures and and problems and then Amazing. reporting it if there's a problem identified but even more clever they've put the same thing on the tracks to identify problems with the brakes on the trains i mean how clever is that it's fascinating uh, and that's the type of thing that I think we need to do more of. We need to improve the routing. We need to improve the, uh, you know, we need to probably tailor more the timetables to, uh, there's no point in running the same service in the night, in the evening, in the morning. It may well be that you need a smaller vehicles in the in the night or you need to do more more based on an app, like demand respond, response transport instead of a regular service. And it just needs a little bit of, uh, a little bit of adaptation in that respect. 
Now, you, you mentioned the Internet of Things there, Enrique. Now, clearly, I, I'm completely au okay fait with the Internet of Things. But <laughs> what, what's the difference between the Internet of Things and the Internet? Surely the Internet is the Internet of Things. Um, well, yes, conceptually, you're right. Um, <laughs> however, um, the, the industry uses the, con, the, you know, the term Internet of Things when things are talking to things as opposed to humans. So it's when two, when two machines are talking to each other, basically, through the Internet. So an example would be a good example. I've implemented one of these recently is where when a you know, ticketing machines are still working, they send an alert to the um, to the uh, service delivery system that logs a, a call and triggers an alert to a to an engineer to go and fix it. So you've eliminated the need for the client to say, "Look, this thing is not working. It's not printing tickets." You, you the machines have talked to each other to tell the engineer that there's a problem with the with the uh, with the with the machine. Fantastic! I think, that is I a think brilliant that's a- analogy. That's yeah. a good example as well of uh, uh, sort of problem to an existing solution as opposed to a solution looking for a problem, I think, in retail. Exactly. I mean, I'm, I've, I've written a, uh, a really comprehensive, I'm sorry for doing a little bit of an uh, advert here, but I've written uh, a very comprehensive white paper with all these topics, which I'll be publishing in the next two weeks on LinkedIn. I will send you a copy. Please Available, do it, available in all good stockists. <laughs> yeah, uh, not, not quite yet. Not quite yeah. yet. I, can't, I can't believe you're using our podcast to plug your own material. Yeah. Sorry. Nine ninety nine on Amazon, people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Probably more like zero point ninety nine. But yes, but great I for think... birthdays. It'll be completely free. Christmas. Completely free. <laughs> So Enrique, we've we've spoken a lot about you know lots of different practical examples of digital transformation, uh, both in the you know passenger transport sector and, and and outside of it. I mean, obviously these they can be very complex, and there's lots of different you know work streams and everything to org- organize and coordinate. But what, do you think there are certain things that any organisation should prioritise when kickstarting a digital transformation program? I mean, you mentioned you know in your opinion, you know, digital and human is is very much intertwined. Uh, how, how, again, how much importance should be placed on, on, on those two aspects? It's absolutely critical, James. It's, it's, the, the thing is, if you, everything we've talked about in, in, in the last, um, you know, the last um, minutes is, is, um, is about digital and, and about human and the fact that human comes first. And the implementation, the prioritization should be exactly like that. So, m- one of the biggest conundrums that I had was in 2016 when we were implementing or about to implement Office 365. And I don't know if you know much about Office 365, but um, people just typically only only know about the, the email and pretty much. But in reality, there's a bunch of the stands of, of applications around Office 365. It's a whole system. It's a whole enterprise system as opposed to just one, one little email thing. So... Um, we were kind of scratching our heads as to in which order to do. And then it was one of those classic you know, times in any organization where people were shouting and it was kind of going the way of whoever shouts the loudest will, uh, will, will win. And, and, and then I, I, I uh, you know, on my way to work, I was thinking, but hang on, this is a human change. This is not just technology. This is human. So I, 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 uh, an idea kind of came to my, to my head of using the Maslow Pyramid of Needs. I don't know if you're familiar with the Maslow Pyramid of Needs yeah. and, the, and the hierarchy of, uh, of needs, but it kind of goes from physiological to safety to belonging to steam and to self-actualization. Principle being... You can never, you can never um, uh, feel, uh, be, be, have self-esteem or belonging if your physiological needs are not covered. So if you, you can apply this same because digital change should be a human change, you can apply such a same principle to prioritizing um, uh, tasks when it comes to, to digital um, transformation. And in this case, what, what we ended up doing was, first of all, we had to satisfy the basic physical needs. And, and safety. So we had to make sure that everyone had a device, the device was up to date, that it was, we didn't have any more XP, any more Windows 7, none of that, that we had identity and then, you know, everyone had their own identity and there was a good process for that, that we could cope with hot desking and that we could cope with licenses and we were legal and the rest of it, and that our cybersecurity arrangements were okay. 
only when you have covered that basic layer of physiological and safety, you can move on to the belonging. And belonging was about interaction and interactivity. So we could then move on to intranet or Teams messaging or video conferencing or, or sharing documents, which funny enough became quite useful in the pandemic. But it, the idea was, you know, is when you start to in that layer of belonging. And then uh, we, we called instead of steam, we called it productivity which was about, you know, how can, how can we improve the way we, the way we work and make it more effective? And then it comes to things like Flow or Power Apps, Delve, you know, tools which are a lot more specialized than, 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 than the basic ones. And, and finally, we went for um, self actualization which we translated into engagement and what tools can we, can we have to engage our employees? And then you, you, you ended up with things like Yammer. Uh, which at the time was was quite popular. So it's it can be applied to this kind of principle can be applied to anything because we humans we've got needs we need to cover the needs with digital solutions we might as well structure them in the same way as we structure our human needs. It feels like it comes back down to communication then to a point that I think we've talked about in this in the past that people don't like change being done to them but people do actually like change if they're involved and they feel that they are being informed of why that change is taking place and if they're part of that journey and using that analogy of, of the maslow's hierarchy of needs is really really clever to look at we've the building blocks first of all we have to do this if we're going to move to the next step this has to be achieved but the goal is we want to get to this that the holy grail is everything is connected everybody knows what their job is and how that fits in within the new technology and the new digital way of working and then you're in a position to be able to really deliver both internally but externally as well to the people that you're providing your services to and, and I think uh, as I bolt on to that, Dave, I think that, that again ties in really nicely with the fact that it needs to, digital transformation, and digital programs, it has to serve a new or existing problem. It can't just be done for the sake of it, yeah. you know, in order to, to create problems that, that you may or may not conceptually think you may have in the future. It has to be fit for purpose. And again, that has to be linked back to your overriding business objective and business strategy. Absolutely, 100%. And also it needs to be a start, a sponsored from the top. If, if the person at the top is seen or perceived as having a lukewarm kind of approach to the change, it's not going to, it's not going to work. It has to be, we, we are, as well as, as well as have needs, humans uh, are, are hierarchical animals. And, and, uh, and if, 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 if we sense that the top of the chain is not there, we will, we will, wrestle or we will at least question why, why the need for this thing if the board doesn't want it in in that instance then enrique if you're in a situation where the business from perhaps one rung down from c-suite and below recognizes that a, cha a change is required but perhaps it's not fully embraced and seen as a requirement by the c-suite is there any way you can influence that? What would you do in that instance? Uh, to be perfectly honest, if there's no sponsorship, I would can it. Right. Because yeah. otherwise you're at risk of wasting a lot of effort, a lot of time, people's goodwill, and and you will to live probably, um, because you'll achieve, you may not achieve much without that sponsorship. Absolutely. So when, again, I was again, in, when I was in Tesco, I, I, it was something we had a rule in in IT in Tesco, which was really really clever. It was you, you couldn't bring you couldn't bring a business case along that wasn't sponsored by a by a director in in by a business director. Brilliant idea, absolutely brilliant. And then I, I guess the fact is that individual would have got the buy in from that business director. You've presented data or whatever information you need to present to be able to get that buy in. And then yeah. you've got that individual's backing to be able to drive things forward. So, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, now CIO would pick up the phone event, you know, every so often and have a chat with a person about the project and you better not get caught saying that he is a sponsor and he isn't. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's brilliant. I think it's absolutely brilliant. It's a really, it's a really good point. Again, it comes, it comes back to that ownership, doesn't it? And, and everyone pulling in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Enrique, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you so much for your time. You know, I think there's a lot to take away here, both in terms of your um, sort of, you know, theory and also the practical examples you've given. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for coming in and being part of the show. Anytime and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to be here today. Thanks, Enrique. And if anyone's interested in uh, reaching out to Enrique directly to, to discuss any of his practical examples or to you know, discuss the digital transformation program you're looking to embark upon, you can find him on LinkedIn. Uh, anything podcast related, you can reach me at james.roson at practicus.co.uk. And me at dave.kemble at practicus.co.uk.